My name is Nick Stanhope, uh, and I'm Chief Executive of the organization behind a project called History Pin that we've been working on with uh, your colleagues in uh, mainly in London, but also over here and in New York for about a year and a half now, and which we properly launched on Monday. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the project got started, how we've been working with you guys, and what we launched on Monday and how we launched it and uh, how, it, how it interacts with maps. We'll do a quick demo. Um, and how, uh, where, the, where we're planning on going. Like I was just saying to some guys beforehand, we've only just scratched the surface and the kind of response to the project this week's made us realize that this thing can go in so many different directions in uh, so many different ways. So, uh, and we'd love to start some conversations from this about what some of those directions might be. So I'm gonna wind back to the very beginning. Uh, we're a nonprofit social organization based in London and our roots are in communities, in neighborhoods looking at ways for people to come together and interact in different ways. We don't do that by kind of raising awareness and getting people to you know, volunteer and be good citizens and take a responsibility. We do that by putting things into the world that nudge people, prompt people to interact in, in different ways, uh, to generate more social capital in neighborhoods, to get conversations going across uh, generations, to increase understanding across different groups. Um, and History Pin is an example of our, it's our kind of biggest and best project so far that does that. Um, so just taking you back to the start of the project, um, this is my grandmother on the right hand side and my great auntie in August 1943 working as land girls in a little village in the middle of, uh, in the middle of England. Um, and before my grand died a few years ago, we spent a lot of time around photographs and home videos, sharing stories, getting a better understanding of each other's lives. Um, and, uh, and it made me wish after she died I'd done it sooner and more often. Uh, and talking to the team and talking to our partners and in, our, in the neighborhoods we work in, this is a pretty common human experience that you spend time around an old photo and a story and it does something a little bit magic and it draws out conversations and relationships and understanding that other type of things can't. And it increases your relationship with the places and the people in your lives in a particularly interesting way. So from this photograph, um, my gran loved this photograph, um, partly because, um, because it, was a, it was a really intense time. It was the middle of the Second World War, and life was hard. It was calmer here than in you know, Stalingrad or uh, on, the, on the front, but it was, it was an intense time. Uh, and also, just after this photograph was taken, a young man drove along the road behind this field uh, and was so taken by these pretty land girls that he crashed into the ditch. And uh, my grandma was pretty, pretty pleased to tell me about how she had some devastating good looks in her day. Um, so it was really lovely, charming memories for me. And, uh, and it started a little bit of a journey, uh, not just into my family, not, about, not just about what had passed between kind of parents and grandparents, and, but also the relationship bet between me and this place, which is a family farm. Um, this is what that field looks like now. Uh, so the differences between my experience and her experience is field to fields uh, in the 40s and, and now. Um, but the road uh, in, in her time looked a bit like this. Uh, these people are parked on the side of the road to go for a Sunday walk. Um, now the road looks a bit more like this, uh, a, pretty big, uh, a pretty big route um, down the middle of England. Um, lots of haulage trucks changed the whole atmosphere and the tone of the village. Um, and, and it started a, an interesting process for me about you know, making comparisons between her time and my time, speaking to neighbors, speaking to local people, speaking to, to people that had moved in or moved away from the area for a, you know, for a few generations. Um, and it led us to, to uh, it led me to start a whole lot of other conversations with the team and, and with our partners, as I said, into how we could unlock the kind of untapped social potential of this content. So everyone's got boxes under their beds and in their attic, Betamax tapes that aren't digitized. And beyond that, archives and institutions have got millions and millions and millions of pieces of content, all of which can play a role, both in, in you know, the small conversations uh, across different generations, across garden fences between neighbors, but the really big conversations across societies and cultures about where we've been and where we're going. Um, understanding that to, to move forward across some of the challenges we face, we have to look back as often as possible. Um, so yeah, the roots of History Pin was unlocking this content that is often buried and untapped and allowing people to interact with it en masse. As an organization, we're all about mass participation and mass access. 
and uh, this seemed to do so much for those two sites. Um, and the, the, the final piece of content that I dug up was this little home video of that same road, kind of in between our two lives, between now and then. Um, and one really nice thing about this new phase of History Pin, which we've just launched, is that it, it's not just photographs, it's also home videos and audio files. Uh, and so allowing a whole more uh, types of content to be shared. So um, I'm going to give you a little walk around. Obviously, um, you, you, know, you can dip into historypin.com anytime. Uh, but I, I'm going to give you a very walk, quick walk around. It's based upon, obviously, the Google Maps API, uh, and obviously allowing you to search by location, but also adding this fourth dimension, adding this timeline, so allowing you to pick particular dates. That date bar will get more and more granular as more and more layers of content get added. At the moment, you know, there's 50,000 pieces of content shared over the desk test phase. Each image comes with particular metadata, date, caption, uh, and, and location. Uh, you can attach stories. Um, and then images that are outdoors and street level can be layered onto modern street view scenes, creating this really nice overlay effect, which a few people have been doing really nicely. We're kind of opening this up for anybody to be able to do with their uh, home photos. Uh, and people have found it a really, a really kind of nice creative experience and ways of bringing their old memories to life. Uh, these are streets in, uh, uh, in uh, Greenwich Village in New York. Um, and as you can see, the journey around street view is uh, is really creative and, and uh, engaging. Um, so, and another thing we've now able to do is not just allow people to make comparisons between old photographs and street view views, but also go into places where those street view views don't exist, which could be indoors or in other public spaces, um, and to, uh, 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 via the app, take exact modern replicas of old pictures. So anything can now be matched between now and then, and we can get a series of windows uh, a series of layers um, in particular locations. Um, so those comparisons really engaging and are now able to be multiplied all over the place. Um, so another big thing that came onto this new version of History Pin was video content, which again, if it's a still camera point, can be overlaid, creating this really great kind of uh, ghostly effect. Um, at the moment, this takes some particular work from our moderation team. It's not that easy for users to do themselves, but it, that will get easier and easier. Um, but again, as you're wandering around the streets, looking at particular eras, being able to open up these little moving windows is um, a, a really um, fantastic way of opening up a relationship with those, with those times and those people. Um, so, uh, and then, and then finally, audio, which I'm not sure is going to play through this. It might just be coming through my slightly tinny laptop. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a little recording uh, from uh, yeah the, the the announcements of the Second World War, uh, and so audio files, speeches, music, uh, live performances. So as you can see, being able to arrive on any street corner in any building, dip into to images, uh, moving images, audio files, narratives. Um, collections features that allows all this to be grouped together uh, around particular events or themes or particular areas, um, providing different ways of bringing out um, elements of, uh, of content. And this really exciting feature which, we, uh, which people are really loving, where it can be strung together in tours. So a particular narrative can be told across the world or across a particular area. Uh, so as you can see, there's some extra narrative added to each step on the top right-hand corner. You follow it on the map. You can add um, audio clips. Um, little, thank you, thank you. I'd like to carry on with some little, uh, little Beatles tour around the world, made up of videos and uh, and audio clips and pictures. Um, and uh, finishing up with this great one on the Champs Elysees where they closed it down and got mobbed by fans. Um, so yeah, that, and that could be applied to anything, personal tours, people, people moving all over the world, in, uh, living in different parts, particular events uh, related to Civil War data. Uh, there's so many, so many areas this could go. And this is just showing about how institutions and users can have a particular presence, which is something we're going to build on um, a lot over the next year, um, and, and allowing those organizations to not just have a great presence on 
history pin in the same way that you have a YouTube channel. You could have a history pin channel, which has got your collections and tours and features, but then embed all of that on your own sites. Uh, so we'll launch the embed tool early January. Um, we'll also be launching ways for organizations, institutions to be able to share tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces of content in one go. Um, as I'll come to, uh, I come to in a minute, those relationships with institutions, um, we've got some really important principles we'll apply to those. Um, you know, we're uh, we using Creative Commons uh, for them to be able to be um, shared and more widely having been shared on History Pin. Um, we've just brought on John Voss uh, from San Francisco, opening up our San Francisco office, uh, whose, whose background is particularly in uh, linked open data. So when institutions share with History Pin and, and standardize their data and open it up, then it can be um, accessed and used and mashed by other organizations. There are other projects like History Pin. Uh, this isn't uh, trying to corner the market in uh, mashing up old content. It's trying to open up the market. Um, and so, you know, those commitments are built into that. Um, and then um, the History Pin app, which is currently uh, just on Android from Monday, but comes out on iPhone uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and this takes, I mean, you can see where it goes pretty naturally onto the streets and onto mobile tools. Um, it takes all of this content uh, and allows you to be followed by it as you're wandering around the streets. Um, so three main areas of the app. Explore a location uh, using a map or using your camera view in augmented reality. Posting a photo uh, and exploring some collections. Um, so the map, yeah, again, fairly straightforward. Timeline and, uh, and allowing your location to be um, uh, allowing you to see what, what content is in your location. Um, pulling up images and the stories attached to them. Um, and then uh, holding up your camera and being able to see images that are close by. Uh, you can see at the bottom there's the, the distance data from how far away you are from those images. Um, holding it up full screen and walking towards it. That one's 177 meters away. And then you get right up to the location and you can get this comparison between old and new. Um, again, you know, people have been, been doing these kind of things, um, but this is really, we feel, opening it up to allow um, both greater access to and greater kind of act, uh, participation and contributions of all of these things. Um, one really nice thing that the feature that, that the app does is encourage people, as you saw when I did the site demo, to take exact modern replicas of old pictures. So indoors, outdoors, public, private spaces, all of those old pictures can be uh, layered onto modern comparisons, uh, which it already has become a little bit of a craze on the site um, because it, it, it really does open up that old content to a new audience. Um, part of the you know, motivation for this was that you show some old pictures to a 17-year-old in a classroom, and it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not got a natural, you know, it's, it's not part of their world, it's not got a natural a gravity. Um, whereas when you start overlaying it, being able to fade in and out, being able to add a whole series of maps, the, the content just comes completely alive. Uh, my background's in teaching and uh, youth work, and we've got some other members of the team who have done that. And uh, the impact of that in the classroom is extraordinary. And um, this, uh, these app tools really expand on the capacity to be able to do that on a bigger scale. Um, so, so yeah, once um, uh, once you've taken a picture, you then go through a pretty simple upload process to pin it. You can also take a picture of an old picture, which is a way of scaling up scanning and digitization, um, or add um, or or add a modern event. Uh, so we're excited about the next kind of you know major historical events when people have got this app. They can all record it and and you know place it in that moment, in that time, capture that moment in history, share their stories. So the next presidential inauguration or or, or royal wedding or whatever it is. Um, you've got thousands of people sharing pictures, sharing memories, and much smaller occasions. Uh, we get lots of people who've got pictures of them coming out of the grocery store. You know, Equally, it's moments in history. Um, we have these debates about what is and what isn't a valuable contribution to the site. And we take a pretty straightforward, well, I do. It's an ongoing debate. But everything is a contribution to this. And the idea of the system is that um, you find what you want to find. If you want to go onto a particular street corner and find out what happened yesterday, you can do that. Um, we, we filter out a little bit of the modern stuff when you first arrive. Um, 
so that you're finding the more interesting comparisons and the more interesting narrative. But essentially, you know, I always point to the nearest chair and say that chair was here at this particular place at this particular time. And it is, in some sense, a contribution to history if it's recorded. And it's not our, it's not our judgment on whether or not that's valuable. Um, if it was a chair in 1840 with a, you know, a queen sitting in it, then it would suddenly become valuable. But that's not a, a kind of value judgment that we make as part of the project. Um, also on here, um, and the tours will come on soon, being able to flick through content when you're not on location. We recognize that people don't spend a lot of time wandering around the streets like that. Um, and they just want something when they're you know, on the subway, on the bus, uh, being able to flick through interesting content. Um, and uh, um, you know, within this, uh, one thing we can't do collections or tours yet is for people to be able to draw down the street view comparisons via the app um, because of the way the API works. But we, we are able for, for when people add their own modern comparisons, for those to become part of those offline experiences as well. Um, so we um, just um, taking a little step back to how we've been working with, with your colleagues in different parts of the world. We took the idea to them uh, when we had some, some, some mock-ups and the kind of social backdrop, the aims, um, and it really resonated um, with, with, the, with, with the teams we spoke to in London. Um, Obi Felton, who's head of consumer marketing for Europe, uh, was a particular lead figure on this. And um, you know, one route was for us just to, to use the API and get stuck in and uh, get our great digital team led by Mike. Where is he gone? Oh, he's there. Yeah, sorry. Uh, led by Mike and our, our team of blogger developers based in Sofia. Um, but another route was to have a, a more, a kind of richer relationship with Google uh, and to explore, um, you know, to get the most out of the tools, uh, to collaborate more widely with the community and education and marketing teams. Um, and that, that's been a, a fantastic relationship for us. And we hope, uh, and, and a kind of, enjoyable and, and creative relationship for the people we work with. Um, I think you know, two specific elements were particularly interesting to the team in London. One was um, the digital inclusion agenda in the UK is particularly prominent at the moment. Uh, the numbers are uh, fairly low compared to the rest of Europe, um, but we're still at 10 million people offline, 10 million more people who use the internet so irregularly, um, you know, they don't really count as being online. Um, and around 65% of them are over 65. So it's not just about access and broadband and community facilities, it's about content that is relevant and engaging and uh, providing a motivation for getting online. So that was one particular area that this opened up. And the other was, was uh, really around, um, you know, after a wave of, uh, you know, amazing uh, launches of Street View, there were little pockets of kind of discontent about what, you know, about what Street View meant about uh, whether it was an invasion of privacy. These arguments were particularly prevalent in, you know, in Germany. Um, and there was some kind of, we have a paper called the Daily Mail in the UK, which um, kind of goes straight for the populist angle. And, uh, and they, they said it was you know, inviting robbers into houses and all that kind of stuff. You, you guys read the media. But essentially, you know, this demonstrated, this helped demonstrate this was an incredibly powerful tool. This was an incredibly powerful way of um, opening up access to our streets and to the world. And, uh, how projects like this could add layers to that uh, and add content to that, that that opened up even more to that. Um, so we've collaborated with uh, with tech teams all over the place. We've been here and met Mano a few times. And uh, on Monday at the launch, we had um, we had Jesse Friedman from the New York office talking um, about the you know the way that this uh, could be used as an example for how people could could creatively and socially um, use Google Maps APIs. Uh, and we'll kind of continue that collaboration. Um, so finally, before I'd be great to get some questions and suggestions and comments and criticism, anything is at this point is extremely valuable. Um, a couple of points about what our role within this is. We've just used Google Maps to open up a canvas for people to add on, uh, at the moment, photos and videos and audio files and narratives. Soon we'll allow other forms, uh, letters and diaries. At the moment we're just deciding exactly um, what the relationship between those types of content is, but all types of content belong as part of a historical narrative of our streets. Um, our role within that is really um, threefold. One, um, 
is around this um, idea of mass participation and mass access. It will be quite easy for a particular organization or a particular group to take ownership of history. History is a battleground for politics. So, I mean, it, even more so here than in the UK, uh, where, um, you know, who, who, who takes ownership of historical events and historical content often wins a political battle. Um, and the same thing could happen to History Pin. Particular issues, particular events, particular streets, particular areas uh, could have their version of history imposed upon them, uh, and the battle could be won. But we want it to be won momentarily until the other side piles in, and the other side piles in, and the crowd eventually cuts all its sharp, jagged edges off, and it becomes a nice, rounded view. Um, so mass participation is absolutely crucial. This can't be uh, this can't be just history enthusiasts, this can't be just institutions. The telling of human history can only be billions of pieces of uh, participation, billions of contributors all over the world. So mass is vital. The second part which relates to that is um, it has to get more and more useful and more and more accurate. It can't just be layer upon layer upon layer of subjective narrative uh, or opinion or, or political will. It has to be something that both for study and research or for just general credibility and use um, has an increasing objective value. The way we're doing that is we see a pin as particularly important, um, which is why we stuck it in the name. Um, a pin represents something on history pin that can get more and more accurate. Uh, at the moment, the way the crowd can impact the accuracy of a, a pin is, 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 is fairly simple. You do, it's just a suggestion, but we'll introduce much more sophisticated crowdsourcing tools um, that allow people to debate the date and location um, of a pin, and so it gets better and better and better and better. Um, and that a pin always represents something objective and always something that is open to popular debate. Then the narrative attached to that pin is always subjective. So a particular photo, uh, which has been improved by 100 people um, to get one piece of metadata, could be surrounded by 100 different stories, all of which you know, complement or, 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 or contradict each other. Um, but that, that type of contribution will always remain subjective. So that relationship between objective, subjective, primary, secondary is another particularly important part. Um, and then thirdly, um, I think um, we, as a community organization, taking this back onto the streets, um, and um, that sounds a bit, a bit ghetto, but uh, I, I, we're, we're taking it back into localities and into neighborhoods and, uh, and um, making sure that this isn't about a Web 2.0 project. This is about the conversations and relationships that we aim to, to kick off in the first place. So we've been piloting what we call local history pin projects in the UK, which see, um, and we're about to, to start one with um, working with Stanford University in East Palo Alto and start one on, um, in, in Harlem as well with the Museum of the City of New York which sees a very intense local experience and facilitates participation from as many groups as possible, gives schools and colleges, museums, archives, um, civic groups, neighborhood groups, a really important role to play and creates an intensely local experience uh, where people come together. Um, so yeah, with those three commitments and a, a small team in London, soon to be a bigger team in San Francisco, we're setting forth to see how this unfolds. Um, at our launch on Monday, we were lucky enough to have um, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Larry Lessig speak, and he, he talked about the unpredictable uh, uses of the web. And I think with this also, he was quick to say, you know, how people use this and where it goes is uh, pretty unpredictable. Um, we've, we've got our principles, um, we've got our commitments, and um, we hope that by applying those, we can carry on guiding it as a positive force. Um, but we're just beginning, so um, we look forward to, to, to hearing what you have to say, and uh, thanks very much for coming. Um, so for questions, um, my team just over here, Mike, John, uh, and Natasha and Rebecca, all might have particular areas that, uh, that, that I might not be able to respond, particularly technical stuff, but if you've got any questions about any of this, or comments, or recommendations, then um, feel very free to to go for it. Yeah. Um, I was just kind of curious about the moderation. Yeah. So what is your system that you get? Well, so active and passive. Uh, active is um, applying kind of fairly straightforward, you know, if there's spam or if there's inappropriate offensive content that just comes down or if someone flags that. 
Um, uh, and the passive stuff is more when people recommend changes to the pinned location and dates. Uh, with our team then shift those around. And that, that's pretty analog at the moment, but it'll become more sophisticated. Uh, but we don't make judgments on quality. We just make judgments on uh, whether or not it's, um, uh, you know, the fairly obvious tick boxes of marketing spam, offensive, inappropriate. So, um, I bet that, that, that will get challenged with that. And just as Wikipedia has equipped thousands of kind of active users to join that army of moderators, we'll do exactly the same thing. So. Okay. Well, um, we're going to be sticking around for a bit um, here, so feel free to. We've got some uh, stickers. I didn't realize until we started working in the States how important stickers were to a project, <laughs> but we've got them. And uh, um, yeah, feel free to take some. Um, so, yeah, thanks everyone for your time.